Welcome to the In the Word Bible class. Uh, we are glad that you have joined us. If you have been uh, watching the previous videos, you'll notice we have a different panel tonight. So I'm going to introduce everyone before uh, we go any further. So would ask you to stand as I call your name, but I'll just ask you to wave your hand. I've heard that some people don't wear proper pants on these video conferences, so just wave instead. Uh, Tonight we have uh, Adam Coyle and wave Adam, okay. And then we have Drew Davis. There's Drew, and then we have Jacob Street. And I am Steve Burns, and so we are your panel for the next few weeks. And we are going to be discussing tonight Romans chapter 12, uh, the first eight verses of of this chapter. And before we get started, I'd give you just a little bit of a background. I'm sure you probably know most of this already. Uh, Romans is a, a wonderful book, a letter from Paul to the church in Rome. And the first several chapters, uh, he lays out a great argument about the need for salvation, and about the role that faith plays and the role that, that we have as sinners needing that salvation and the grace of God. And it's, it's just a wonderful book. And then you get to chapter 12, of which I really enjoy because it has just a lot of practical advice on how to live a Christian life and how to be a Christian out in the world and how to live for God and what that looks like. So we're going to look at the first part of that tonight uh, just to see what that's like. And we have things divided up. Uh, for different people to take responsibility for different parts. And Jacob is up first, actually, with verses 1 and 2. Uh, so, Jacob, if you would read those verses and tell us uh, what they mean to you. Yeah, sure. Um, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, you know, there's a lot probably just within those first two verses, um, and, and really the whole chapter of, of Romans 12. You could probably do a whole quarter, um, I imagine, just on that one chapter from how much is in there. But you know, in looking at the first two verses, uh, I found it interesting and in just reading a couple of notes at the bottom of my little study Bible here. Uh, the first two things that it highlights is the word therefore, and then the, the phrase mercies of God. Um, and, you know, I, I know I a lot of times kind of maybe skip over that part and I get to the quote unquote meat of the verse where it talks about living sacrifice. Um, but I think it's important. Um, and Steve, you just kind of laid out what, ta what, what it talks about in chapters 1 through 11. But Paul is saying, you know, with this word, therefore, he's kind of saying, because of all of these things that I just talked about um, leading up to this, uh, you know, kind of in, in chapters 1 through 11, uh, because of these things, I urge you uh, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Um, and so it's, it's, it's almost kind of this implication of because of these things, we have a response. We have a responsibility. We have um, a, a way that we are to, to strive to live. Um, and then also by the mercies of God, you know, we, we can't do anything. We can strive all we want to, um, but, but without the mercies of God, uh, being able to truly offer our body as a living sacrifice is meaningless, but it's because of that mercy that God has granted us. But when you think about, you know, uh, a living sacrifice. Obviously, Paul's kind of making this correlation between the old law, uh, where they offered physical sacrifices, and kind of comparing it to this new life that we have in Christ, uh, and offering our bodies as living sacrifices. And he calls it holy and acceptable to God. And when I think about the Old Testament uh, in offering a sacrifice, 
Uh, there was this idea of, of first fruits. There was this idea of bringing the best uh, that you had to offer um, and, and bringing the most, you know, pure lamb, the most unblemished lamb um, uh, and, and other forms of animals. But, but, but the idea of bringing your best, um, that was kind of the goal, I, I think, um, all for the glory of God, but that was kind of your goal in the Old Testament. And so correlating that to this, you know, offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, I think uh, um, what it means to me is what am I doing to present my best? What am I doing to present my best to God? Um, on a daily basis, what does that look like? Um, and, and obviously, like I just said, we can't do that without the mercies of God. But, um, you know, we do have a, a role. We do have a responsibility to try to do our best. Um, in this daily striving, you know, um, to, uh, to offer our best is, is in, in living for him and and giving him the glory, you know, that's our spiritual worship. And then moving on into verse two, um, not being conformed to this world, uh, but being transformed by the renewal of our minds that we may, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Um, when I thought about this verse, I thought about also um, Colossians 3, verse 2, which has a similar theme. That's set your minds on things that are above, not on things uh, that are on the earth. And so, you know, I think it's very easy to get entangled in the things of this world. Um, we know on a daily basis there's so much going on in our world um, and, and just, you know, selfishly, uh, you know, I'm always looking to my schedule, what's happening next on my agenda, um, what's, what's the next either extracurricular activity or, or what's the next thing I need to do for my job. Or, you know, we get involved in so many things in this world that it's easy to make that our focus. And we can almost make some of those things our idols. Um, and that's kind of this idea of being conformed to the world and, and not allowing God to transform our minds. But if our goal, if our, our constant desire is to think on things that are above, that's that transformation that starts to take place in our minds. Um, and God will work through that. Um, but, you know, the more and more that we think on those things above, the more our minds will be transformed. Um, and then it talks about in the latter part of that verse, we'll be able to discern what is the will of God. Um, but it's, it's hard to know what that is without constantly trying to feed ourselves with, with his word and, and thinking about him. So those are the kind of the things that I guess come to my mind uh, when I looked at these two verses. That's good. You, you actually started off with what I would have started off with as well about therefore and about because of all that that happened ahead of time. Anybody else have any thoughts you want to add there? The only thing I, I can think of is, you know, the way it ends, you know, good, acceptable, and perfect. You know, that, that last word, perfect. I mean, that's, that, that is the will of God. That it is, it is perfection. Uh, I think that's just, you know, one thing going through that, that section, it ends right there, and it's just, that's it. It's just perfect. Exactly. All right, we'll move on to verse three, and that one is me. And so I'll read that now. It says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has dist distributed to each of you. And let me back up a little bit before I even talk about this verse, going back to what Jacob talked about and about being transformed and what that means uh, to me the verses that come after the rest of the chapter talks about how we are transformed and how we are different from the world and it starts off with with the big one and that's uh it is very relevant to us today very relevant to me today is do not think of yourself more highly than you ought and that's uh, something i can work on every day uh, something uh, to remember every day is that I'm not always as great as I think I am. I don't always have it all together. I don't always know what's going on. My way is not always the right way. Uh, so I need to 
remember that, not think of myself more highly than I ought, but rather think of myself and everyone else with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And God has given all of us faith. It is important for us to remember that we all have this faith and we are all striving to serve God and we are all trying uh, to do the best that we can to serve him. And so it, it's not just about me. It's not just about look how good I am or look at all these things that I've done. We are all working together and you are just as important as I am. You are just as blessed by God as I am. And uh, that uh, you see the need for that so much in today's world as well as, as back then. It's, it's interesting that the things that Paul was writing 2,000 years ago are just as relevant now uh, to the world that we're living in. And uh, it, that's amazing to me all the time. Uh, a verse that, to me, that really goes along with this and is not one that, that you might always think of, but, and it's not one that I would have always thought of, uh, but it's James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. James there says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. So, it's just one example of, of how we do that and how we don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but listen to others, be quick to listen and slow to speak, slow to become angry. There again, remembering that, that my way is not necessarily the right way or the only right way. Other people's opinions uh, matter. Uh, their viewpoints matter. I may not agree with them. Uh, they may not even be right, but sometimes it's important to just show that you're listening to what they have to say, that you care about them as a person, and that you can uh, reason with them and talk it out instead of just saying, well, I know I'm right, you go on with your life. And then also another verse that comes to mind is probably one that most people think of, Philippians chapter 2, uh, where Paul again there says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And Paul goes on from there to discuss that more. But that's a good example to us. Of if, if Jesus was willing to leave heaven and come live here on earth and be among us, even though he was God, then how much is it to expect from us not to think of ourselves more highly? And we ought. Jesus had every right to think of himself more highly than us because he is. Uh, but we can follow his example and, and live with humility and put others above ourselves. So that's uh, what that verse means to me. Since I was the one that divided up these verses, I picked that one because it's one of my favorites. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. When I say you, I'm talking to me. Do not think of myself more highly than I ought. So any comments or reactions or anything about of that verse. If not, then we'll move along uh, to verses four and five, and that is Drew. All right, Romans 12, verses four and five. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So, First, when I read this, the first thing I think of is over 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read all of the verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but I do want to, I do want to hit on those um, before we discuss them. And Adam, I'll try not to bleed over too much into your verses either. Um, in 1 Corinthians 12, um, starting with verse 12, it says, for just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body Though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Um, also in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, it kind of goes through the, uses the body as an, as an analogy here. And um, like I said, I'm not going to hit all of them, but we'll look at verse 15. 
as, as an example, it says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make, make it any less part of the body. And he goes on to say, you know, um, if the whole body were, were an eye, well, okay, that, that's great. I guess maybe you could see well, but what about your sense of smell, your sense, sense of taste? Um, and I think this all comes down to, um, you know, we're in the, in the church, we're, we're all different, but yet again, we're all, we're all there for the same reason. We're all, um, should come together as one body there in the church. Um, we don't all have the same talents. Um, we're not expected to all have the same talents. And if we did, it'd be a pretty boring place. Um, you, you know, but that, that's where it, it takes everybody uh, to make it work. Um, another section there in, in 1 Corinthians 12, I want to read the last, the last part of verse 24 um, through verse 26. Uh, it says, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So going back to Romans 12, um, you know, those verses over there in 1 Corinthians, to me, it's, it's kind of like an extension here of, of these verses here in Romans. Um, you know, it, it kind of goes a little more in depth uh, to me, or, or maybe, maybe in my mind, it, it paints that picture uh, more vividly. Um, you know, we, we're one body, we're many members, but, you know, we can't, we can't do it all on our own. Like Steve said, we can't think of ourselves more highly than we are. Um, you know, you may, you may think, you know, you're sitting there and you may think, oh, I could have you know, led that song a lot better than that. Or man, I could have I could have done this better. Um, you know, chances are probably not. Um, you know, that's that that's that whole thinking of yourself more highly than you ought. But um, you know, we're not all meant to have the same talents. Um, we're 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 not perfect. Nobody nobody is meant to be perfect. There was there was one perfect individual to walk this earth, and none of us none of us are that individual. Um, so t- to me, these verses you know, kind of go uh, with what Steve was saying. This is, this is to kind of put yourself in check. Um, you know, we're, um, we, we are individuals. We're not, we're not perfect. Um, we don't always get along with one another, but in the church with the members, uh, as it says in, in the first Corinthians uh, 12 verses uh, at the end, there's 24 through 26. You know, when, when one member hurts, you know, we all hurt. When we rejoice, you know, we, we all rejoice because that's, that's, that's what family does. Um, and, that, and that's what, that's what we are. We're all one body. We're all one, one family. Um, I don't want to bleed over into Adam's, into Adam's here. So I'm, I'm going to stop there. Um, if anybody wants to add anything, please, please feel free to do so. To me, that's one of the things that I've noticed during all this time where we've been separate because of uh, the coronavirus is that we aren't together with our church family. So in many ways, I feel incomplete because I'm not there with all of my body together, so to speak. So it, it's been great the times that we've gotten to be back together recently because we are all together in this. and. And we do rely on each other. So it, it's been a good reminder of that, the time that we've been apart. Anybody else? If not, we'll turn it over to Adam. And Adam has verses 6 through 8 of Romans chapter 12. All righty. So I'll go ahead and read Romans 12, um, 6 through 8. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the propitiation of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with 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 liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who sows mercy with cheerfulness. And I, I like how 
you know, these, these verses really do flow and how Paul is, is making, you know, making a point. And, and the point, you know, he's saying is we're all a part of the family. We're all part of the, the, the church and of the body of Christ. But each and every one of us, while we are part of the whole, each and every one of us has a uniqueness and a gift that has been given to us from, from the Father. And, and, and as he kind of goes through this, you know, a couple of points that, that I really wanted to try and pull out of this is when you're thinking about the gift that God has given you, can you identify what that gift is? Can you, can you think back in your experiences and in your, in your relationships and in your conversations and, and in, and all the things that you've done, can you pinpoint what it is that God has given you and what is that gift that you've been given? You know, Jesus tells the story in Matthew 5, 25 of, you know, the parable of the talents and, you know, how that, you know, the owner gives talents to, to, to all these different individuals. So all of us have been given the gift what is yours? And if you haven't been able to identify what that gift is, then, then I challenge you to really pray over that and to really do some soul searching to try and figure out what it is that God has given you and what talent and gift has God given you. And if you know what that is, then the challenge is how do you use it? What are you doing every day to show glory to God with that gift that, that, that you've been given. And as Paul goes through, you know, these, these couple of verses here, and he talks about in verse six, you know, that we have gifts that are all different according to the grace given to us. And at the end of verse six, he says, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. You see, all of us have been given a gift and it's commanded that we use that gift. And so when you think about what is your gift, how are you using it? Because it, you know, he tells us that we have and we are commanded to use that, that gift that, that he, you know, has given us. And if you turn over to Ecclesiastes uh, nine and verse 10, you know, Solomon, you know, he tells us that, whatever our hand finds it to do, that we're to do it with all of our being, with everything that we have. And Paul goes on here in Romans 6, and he lists out several different examples of different gifts that individuals may have been given. And I like what he does with each example, because with each example he gives, he then not only says, hey, you know, if, if your gift is to give, then you're supposed to give liberally. If your gift is to prophesy, then you are to prophesy with everything that you have. And so each gift that we've been given, each talent that we've been given, God also provides within us the ability to use that at an extra and an, an extraordinary way. And so that's really, you know, when I look at and I think about, you know, what Paul is saying here, he's saying, hey, you know what? You've been given a gift. You need to not only protect that gift, but you need to perfect that gift and use it so much so that, that you do it in a way that it becomes easy and you perfect that that gift and and then lastly you have to practice it you have to go out and you have to use that gift that that god has given you and you have to do all of those things and always do it to glorify god and that's what paul here is saying is as he rounds out you know this this passage you know he's saying we're all different 
we're all part of one body, but each and every one of us is different. And what makes you unique is what makes you special. And what makes you special is what gives you the ability to glorify me in an extraordinary way. And so, you know, that's really what I think we have to take away from this is what is your gift? Do you know it? And if you don't, then you got to pray about it and you got to figure it out. And if you do know what your gift is, are you practicing it? Are you protecting it? And are you perfecting it? And if you're not, then, you know, then you're not doing what God has called and what God has commanded you to do. And I'm going to close with reading First uh, Peter chapter, five, uh, chapter 4, and beginning in verse, my apologies, uh, verse 10. First Peter 4, beginning in verse 10, and then I'll read uh, verse 11 as well. Each one of us has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards on the manif- on the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do as one who is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength of God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Paul teaches us to use that gift to glorify him. And here Peter says the exact same thing. You've been given a gift. Figure out what it is and then go use it to serve and to glorify God. Excellent. Anyone have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, uh, this is probably this particular topic when you talk about uh, the one body having many members and many talents and many gifts um, kind of serving the same goal, um, though we are different. It's probably one of my favorite things to talk about or, or to, to learn about. Um, it kind of reminds me of, uh, the old, uh, the old phrase, ask not what can your country do for you, but what can you do for your country kind of thing, you know? And I, and I think that's, um, I liked what Adam said about how the, it's a command to not only find our gift, but to use that gift for his glory. Uh, because I think a lot of times we think about the body and we think about the church. And I think too often we look uh, into it as what can the church offer us? What can the body offer us? And really what this verse is talking about is what can we do to offer to the church and to the people that we serve? Um, and that's, that's kind of a, I guess a mentality. It's kind of a mindset that we have to have is, um, that though the body is important to us, it's certainly encouraging to us. There's, there's things that we do, um, gain from that, but, but the mindset is how do I be a part of that? How do I serve as a part of that body, um, and glorify God through that? And so I really appreciate what, what Adam had to say on that. You know, when Adam was talking, I was thinking of, uh, you know, talking about exercise, that gift, practice it. You know, what, what happens if, if you don't exercise, if you don't practice it? you lose it. Um, you know, it's not going to be there. You know, I always, I can't think of the wording off the top of my head. But you hear people talking about, you know, if you have this skill and you expect that in a time of need and time of stress that you're going to rise to the occasion, that you're going to be able to perform this skill. Well, that's, that's not, um, that's not the case. You're going to fall back on to the skill that you've mastered. So if you don't practice that skill, if you don't master that skill, when the time comes to use it, it's not going to be there. You're not, it's not just going to magically come to you. You have to practice it. You have to master it so that when it comes time to use it, you're, you're training. You're going to go back to the level at which you have mastered it. So that's where the practice and exercising that skill comes in. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've shared with this before, but, you know, Dale Carnegie, you know, he talks about how that many of us often say practice makes perfect. And, you know, Carnegie makes the point, he says, nobody's perfect. But if we practice something so much, then it becomes permanent. And so practice becomes permanent. 
And, and the idea is just what Drew's talking about is it becomes a reflex and, and it becomes who you are. And so, you know, in those moments or in those times of trial or in those, those times where that gift is needed, it becomes an automatic reflex because you've practiced it so much. And, and so I really like what, you know, what Drew says and, you know, and Dale Carnegie and how he, he phrases that, that, that practice makes permanent. I'm reminded of a youth group retreat that was uh, probably 20 years ago or close to it now. And I forget who the speaker was. I was there as an adult volunteer, obviously. I wasn't in the youth group 20 years ago. <laughs> but the, the speaker was talking about these verses and talking about uh, the gifts that we have. And what he was encouraging us to do was to focus on something that we felt like was a gift that we had. And then we had some time to go off by ourselves and pray about it. And so just a private thing. You didn't tell anyone else what your gift was, what you thought you could do. And what I determined, one thing I determined in my mind that I could do was be an encourager. I could encourage other people. So that's what I focused on, prayed about, and then the retreat was over and we went home. I didn't tell anybody <laughs> at all what, what I had decided. and Nobody did, as far as I know. Uh, the next Sunday, uh, when we were at, at church, uh, one of the gentlemen from our church whose son was there on the retreat with us, uh, there again, hadn't told anyone, but he came up to me and said, I just want you to know how much of an encouragement you are to my son. And I thought, wow. And, and I say that not to, not to <laughs> toot my own horn or pat myself on the back, but if you, if you practice it, if you spend time in prayer focusing on that, God will give you opportunities to use that gift. And if, if that's not your gift, he will show you other gifts that you can use and you can <laughs> do effectively. Uh, so spend time in prayer, especially about it. Identify what your gift is and spend time in prayer. Anybody else have anything before we wrap up? As Jacob said, I believe it was earlier, for each of these verses, you can make a sermon or a whole series of sermons about each one of these <laughs> verses that we've gone through, and yet they all work together so well. It's, it's sometimes good to look at them individually, and sometimes good to look at them as a whole and see how we do transform ourselves, allow ourselves to be transformed by changing our minds to put others before ourselves and to see what our gifts are so that we can serve others in that capacity. So that's, that's what we've been looking at tonight. Uh, we thank you for joining us and for uh, listening to what we have to say and uh, we hope to see you again soon. We hope to see you in person at the Bartlett Woods Church Building. If you can join us there, and we hope to see you again at one of our In the Word Bible classes. Thanks for joining us.